1997, Charles Vacanti shocked the world with this. I want you guys to look at this for a second. It's, it's gross. It's cartilage cells taken from a cow, grown in the shape of a human ear implanted on the back of a mouse. It's weird, it's disgusting, it's horrible, but his research had a point. He showed that we can change and control the growth of cells. I work as a research assistant in Dr. Sugg's cardiovascular tissue engineering lab at the University of Texas at Austin. And one of the applications of our research is something called regenerative medicine. This involves taking cells out of a human body, growing them in a lab environment, and then putting them back in the human body for the purpose of repairing damaged tissue or organs. Specifically, the experiment that I'm helping with right now looks at finding ways to differentiate stem cells into cardiomyocytes. Stem cells are a type of cell that don't really do much on their own, but have the potential to become a lot of different cells. And cardiomyocytes are actual heart muscle cell. It's what moves, it's what beats, it's what, makes, it's what makes your blood pump. And the way we kind of create this transformation is we create a stress on the cells that mimics that that would actually be found in a heart. We put magnetic beads in each of the cells, we have magnets outside the cells, and we move the magnets while the cells are growing in a way that twists and contorts the cell that like they would naturally be twisted in the actual human body. And we look at the result and see if and to what extent the cells have actually become cardiomyocytes. I'm 19 years old, and while I may sound like I know what I'm talking about, I really, really don't. Because here's the thing about this field. No one knows what they're talking about. There are over 37.2 trillion cells in the average human body, over 100,000 genes, hundreds and hundreds of bones and tissues, and within each of these elements, there are even more layers of complexity. Just one change in a cell or a gene can completely make the difference between someone being perfectly healthy and someone having a fatal disease. And in a lot of those cases, we have absolutely no idea why. That used to scare me a lot. I used to get really freaked out by the idea that you can't control every element of a cell. You can't just not control it. You can't even begin to know every element because there are just too many. When I first started doing my type of research, I you know, was worried that the work I was doing was so small in the big sphere of things. For example, I'm looking at one type of stem cell going into one type of cardiomyocyte in an environment that I've manufactured. Uh, or our lab together as manufactured, and that's, that's, that's a kind of a small part of the entire problem. Um, it wasn't that I couldn't see the big picture of what I was doing, it was that I could see it maybe a little all too well, and that, that end goal was really far away. But hey, there are some great things about working in fields that have such big questions, and one of them is we're not alone. In my lab, there are over 15 other undergraduate and graduate students looking at similar experiments to what we're doing. At UT, there are two other labs looking at cardiovascular disease and tissue engineering, and across the world, there are hundreds and hundreds of people united towards the same goal. We're all, we're all in this together. It's really comforting for me to search words like cardiomyocyte or hydrogel in a database and find thousands of articles showing that people are wondering about a lot of the same things that I wonder about every single day in lab. That's nice. I like that feeling. And there's really, really good reason why it's vital that we have so many people looking at this research. It's that we fail a lot. But this is what I look like when I fail. Also, I really like taking pictures of, my, of myself in lab, so bear with me as I give you more selfies. Um, <laughs> but. Human error is one of the biggest sources of failure. I know in the last two years, I've dropped way too many things to count. I've spilled things, I've broken things, I've counted cells wrong. And that's really hard to admit in and of itself. It's hard to go up to your graduate student and be like, hey, Laura, I, I've dropped something, I've spilled something, I've messed up hundreds of your dollars and a week's worth of your time, and we have to start over. I'm sorry. That sucks. That's really hard to do. But even when you, know, you painstakingly go over everything multiple times, even when you double check things, triple check things, things in this field can still go wrong. Cell solutions can die, solutions can get infected, controls can get messed up, the results can be so far off from what you expected that you know something must have gone wrong, but you might have no idea where to start to find out what exactly it was. But hey, in the face of all that failure, that just means that we are all the more excited about each and every success that we do have. And this is me being successful. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, so to give you a little bit of background information on the next video I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a video of cells. They started out as stem cells, which don't really do much. They were just floating in liquid, and we're trying to see if they've actually become cardiomyocytes or beating heart cells. 
Tell me if you can actually see anything moving. OK, I just want to reiterate how, how cool this is. This is. These are cells that are in a Petri dish by themselves doing this of their own accord. We're not, we're not kind of electrically impulsing them from the outside. We're not, we're not moving them in any way. They're, they're doing this by themselves. They're, they're actually moving. Um, wait, wait, before you clap, I have one more video to show you guys, because I really like these videos. It's, it's cute. You can see it. I mean, it's, now, now you guys can clap. You can go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, I took this video about three days ago, and I, I actually was showing every single person in all of my classes, even if they had no interest in seeing it. Like, I was, I was so excited. This is, this is incredible. They're cells that didn't start out as heart cells. They started out as something completely different. And you know, by using processes that we do in a lab, that we have kind of created, we've made them into something else. We've made them into a system that works and beats together and, and almost looks like an actual heart. These are just cells in a Petri dish. That's, that's crazy. That, that blows my mind. That's, that's one of the coolest parts of my work. Um, and I think kind of the fact that everything is so dynamic, it's so alive, it's moving, is my favorite part. I mean, whenever you kind of imagine a mad scientist, you imagine the typical lab worker sitting like in a corner, kind of pouring over chemicals and being really stressed out about equations and crunching numbers, and yeah, we're, we're pretty mad. I, I look mad there. But, I mean, there's a very human aspect to each and everything that we do. We're working to save human life. We're working to reduce the amount of pain that people have to go, to, go through. We're working to try to help people live longer, and that, that makes me feel like I have meaning in what, what we're working on. That's a, that's a good feeling. Whenever I talk about this type of research, people always ask, you know, how did you get into it? And to be honest, my story is a little bit boring. When I came into the university, I just emailed a bunch of professors and asked them if they'd be willing to take a freshman in their lab. And a lot of them said no, but Dr. Suggs, one of them, said yes. And Laura, my grad student, was willing to teach me everything I know about cell culture. Um, for me, what's interesting about my story is that I actually didn't know what I wanted to do when I came in and when I was emailing professors. I didn't even really know what my major, biomedical engineering, even meant as a freshman, which is probably a problem. But um, I, I just was able to kind of look at different things, look at what interested me, whatever I thought that meant, and I emailed someone, and they actually responded positively. Another thing uh, about my work is that I actually didn't enjoy the first couple of weeks that I was working. It was, I had to learn how to pipette things, which is just, you put a liquid into another, into another tube. It's kind of boring. Um, I had to kind of train, I had to learn all the lab procedures, and it was only kind of after I understood what I was doing that I really started falling in love with the research that I was working on. I realized that I'm doing some cool stuff as an 18, 19 year old. I'm, I'm actually doing things that could potentially have an impact. What I realized from you know, working in a lab is that I didn't have to know what I wanted to do in order to start it. I just had to put myself out there enough to try. And I had to stick with it long enough to figure out if I actually liked it or not. In 1997, Charles Vacanti showed us that we have the power to you know, control cells. And since then, we've been working to fine tune that control. I mean, in this field, we're going to have a lot of big problems that are not going to be solved anytime soon, but we have a lot of people working with us on these problems. Um, we're going to fail a lot. We're going to fail over and over and over again until, I mean, you look, like, you look like this. But the successes that we do have are going to completely revolutionize the fields of health and medicine. Research and really any type of research or field that you're passionate about has the potential to make a difference if you're willing to put yourself out there. Together, we have the power to save human lives. Thank you.